our ancient words of life. For today are taken from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Connie. Please pray with me. <laughs> Father, we desire to grow. We want to know you more. We want to experience peace. We want to experience hope. We have dreams of what relationships should be, and they're often dashed against the rocks of reality. But yet your spirit pushes us forward. Bind us together now in the preaching of your word, in your name, amen. Morning, you can sit down. How are you doing? Good, good. Raise your hand if you're in a small group. Okay, actually better than I anticipated, uh, but still it looks like to me maybe only about 10% of you. 10% of us are in small groups. And uh, that's going to have to change, folks. It's just going to have to change. We can't keep growing and not become more of a small group church. We need to have relationships. Now, I know that for a lot of you, and I'm not a, I'm not a woman, so I can't speak for women. I'm a guy, and I can speak more easily for guys. But I think for a lot of guys, at least, the idea of small group, uh, I don't need people getting in my business, right? Well, guys, and if you're a lady that feels this way too, we have developed a special small group just for you. Sound, please. Are you tired of small groups always getting into your business, trying to get you to share your feelings, discuss your past, confess your sins? Are you just looking for a place to kick it, network, maybe get some free grub? Me too. That's why I created what I believe to be the world's first openly shallow small group. We're not here to deal with messy stuff like feelings and emotions. You got problems? you deal with that. You're an adult. Life ain't easy. So stop the pity party. We all have our issues. We don't really want to do life together. Frankly, at Shallow Small Group, we try not to do much of anything at all. You'll never hear us use the term, unpack that thought. We're sure it's packed away for a really good reason. <laughs> and you'll never hear us use the term accountability unless you're talking about someone who deals with numbers. Hey, dude, thanks for doing my taxes. You have great accountability and spiritual growth. Who wants growth? I had a growth removed last week. <laughs> it wasn't pleasant. There's no pressure here to remember each other's name. What's going on, buddy? Oh, hey, man. How's it going? That's yeah, cool. Good. 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 Oh, dude. Captain, what's going on? We know you have a name, and that's the important thing. Group discussion? You got tickets to the big game? Sweet. Let's spend some time on that. Oh, you and your wife are struggling financially? There's tension in the relationship? Uh, that's not really the vibe we're going for. We avoid conflict like the plague. Who wants cake? <laughs> Come on and get it! <laughs> and there will never, ever be an awkward silence. That's our guarantee to you. We hate bad theology as much as the next guy, and we know the surest way to prevent bad theology is to avoid theology altogether. And outreach? This is the only outreach you'll ever have to do. 
Some people say we're superficial, but hey, the word supers and superficial. I mean, who doesn't want to be super? Shallow small group, because when things get too deep, people drown. <laughs> Won't you join us? That's me, about fifth grade. I lose track of what year it is, somewhere in the late 70s. Notice the really cool plaid pants. Yep, an orthodontist dream. That was me. When I was that age, Bismarck had something that it doesn't have right now that was a godsend to a young man like me. I was absolutely infatuated with the opposite sex. I thought that girls were wonderful and mysterious and absolutely terrifying. I, I had crushes on girls, but I just could not bring myself to talk to them or, you know, other than in superficial ways, you know. But Bismarck had something then. It was called Wheel a While. Anybody, give me an amen if you know what I'm talking about, Wheel a While. Give me an amen if you ever took a, a little bit of skating at Wheel a While. Really? <sighs> More hippies. I love it. Wheel a While was a roller rink in Bismarck that is now occupied by New Song Community Church. And for a kid like me, Wheel a While was my fighting chance to actually get to talk to and touch a girl. They had something called couple skating. The, you didn't just go there and skate. Well, you could do that, but they had some structure to it. They had some things that you could do, and they had something called couple skating. Now, remember, this was the disco era, right? Disco balls and, and all the music, and, and then they'd have this couple skating time. And so they would say, all the girls, get out onto the skating floor. And the girls would come out, and they'd make this big circle. And they'd say, okay, guys, go on out. And the guys would go out, and they'd make a circle inside the girls' circle, so you'd pair off with a girl, right? So you're outside. And then they'd start playing the romantic disco music. Dream weaver. And you'd be skating. And then the whistle would blow. Dream, weep, and you'd, and you'd move up to the next girl. And, you know, some girls would kind of look at you. <laughs> and other girls would look like, you know, look at you like you were the plague. But you just keep rotating and rotating. And a lot of times you always had your eye on this one girl that was always seemed just out of reach, you know, 10 or 15 girls down the circle, you know. And, and you get to the point where... I don't know if they're going to play another song. If they do one more song, I'll make it. And, and the whistle blows, and there's just sort of this silence. And you're like, no, no. And then all of a sudden, last dance, last chance for love. Donna Summer. And you're like, yes. And you hold her hand. And you just soak up that one moment. Wheel of Wild did not turn me into some sort of Casanova, but it did help me grow in a way that I would not have grown otherwise. It gave me a socially structured and acceptable place to risk connecting with the opposite gender. And, you know, part of me honestly wishes that it was still here for my kids. I wish my kids would have had that. I got one kid who doesn't have a problem with that. I got another kid, hmm. You know, and I think we need those places when we need to grow. We need places where we can risk growing, where there's enough structure and acceptance where we can grow. And I think that church and small group can offer that to us if only we're willing to risk. What most people don't realize is, is that they think that when the church says, hey, we need to do small groups, they think that the church is talking about some sort of newfangled idea that's different from traditional church. And you couldn't be more wrong about that. That biblically, what we do today, what we call traditional church, that's not how it was when it started. 
Traditional church is the newfangled thing. Small groups is how church started. Acts 42, 2.42 said this. This is the early church. These Christians, these people who followed the way of Jesus, it said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And they would go on to say, and they gave to each other as they had need. And by the way, they didn't meet in any churches. There were no churches. The word for church is ecclesia. It means those who are gathered. And the first instance of ecclesia happens in the words of Jesus, but then is really enforced in the book of Acts. Those who are gathered in the name of the risen one. And they did not have church buildings and sound systems and lights and audio systems and Sunday school classrooms, and offices, and copiers, and all that. They met in each other's homes. They would eat together. And, oftentimes, as part of that gathering, they would then have communion, the breaking of the bread and the wine, as part of those meals. They were called agape feasts. Greek word agape, love, love feasts. And they met as small groups. The irony is, is that in some, for some reason, the church sort of outgrew that idea as the church became larger, more numerical, and, and, and uh, more structured and organized. And I'm not saying that that was a bad thing. This is not a bad thing. Don't want to suggest that at all. But we began to lose touch with each other sometimes in the size of things. It's easier to be shallow in larger groups, wouldn't you agree? A lot easier. And I say that as somebody who, hey, at least 50% of me is that dude, the shallow group guy. There are times where I just don't want to get into people's business. I don't even want to get in my own business, you know? I want to be what Jerry Seinfeld says all guys do. You know what Jerry Seinfeld says that all guys do? Do you know what's really on our mind, women? Do you know? Have you ever wondered? You have, haven't you? You know what Jerry Seinfeld says? is on our minds? We're just walking around, looking around. That's what he says. Guys, we're just walking around, looking around. What other mind would decide to go to the moon and make it a priority to make a car to drive around on it for, huh? That's what we are. We have a lot of that. But the truth is, it's not limited to guys, is it? Women want to connect, but, but at the same time are horribly afraid to connect because trust is hard, isn't it? It's hard. Now, the text for today is interesting because we read it and we're tempted to read that and think, oh, well, that's what I should experience when I come to church. But you have to read this and understand that Paul is imploring, he's exhorting. This is out of Philippians. It's right before the famous Philippians verses where he talks about Christ and his humility and how he submitted and, you know, uh, so... He's talking about this, but it's really more of an exhortation because by this point, by the time the point that, that, that Paul writes this, he has already experienced many years of ups and downs with the early church. And we're tempted to think that somehow the early church was this wonderful small group utopia, and it was not by any way, shape, or form. All you have to do is read the words of Paul himself in First and Second Corinthians and in other books of the New Testament. Corinthian church was a mess. It was messy. Very messy. Far worse than us, I have to say. Y'all, are you messy? Are you imperfect? Give me an amen if you're imperfect. Not enough amens. There's some real arrogant people out there. Give me an amen if you're imperfect. Okay, yeah. Yeah! Broken and imperfect people make broken and imperfect relationships, and broken and imperfect relationships cluster together in broken and imperfect communities, and th that's what the church is, that's what we are. We're broken and imperfect, and our relationships are that way, aren't they? In Corinth, it was ugly. We had, Paul was dealing with people who were in ancestral relationships, people, rich people who were gorging themselves at the love's feast and leaving no food for the poor people. 
Christians who were suing each other, and the list just goes on and on. People who were acting crazy during worship time. It was, it was a huge list of things that he's addressing. And yet, does Paul ever give up? No, right? He exhorts. Therefore, if you have any, what? From being united with Christ, if any, from his love, if any, in the spirit, right? If any, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. If you have any of this, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in what? Humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I'd like to tell you that when you join a small group here, and it could be a learning group, it could be more of a long-term kind of life group, because some of you are in groups that have been meeting for years, right? It could be a healing group where you, you come because you need some healing for something in your life. It could be any one of those. I'd like to tell you that it will be just a bowl of cherries. It'll just be a bed of roses. It'll be wonderful. That other person in the group will never push your buttons. And you'll never push theirs. And that would be a lie, wouldn't it? Yeah. Sometimes we think that the church should be utopia, that when we come here, this is the one place where it should be perfect, and it's not. And then we get dis disenchanted, and we say, oh, the church doesn't work, that Christian thing doesn't work, we walk out all bitter. We come to church long enough until we get disappointed by something or someone, and then we say, oh, that's a terrible church, and we move on, especially in today's consumer culture. And we've forgotten how to grind through relationships and let the healing and forgiving Spirit of God grow them. I got bad news for you. If you think relationships should grow because they're easy, you're wrong. They don't. They grow when they get hard. I, I, you'll get a kick out of this. I, I looked at Scott at the last service. I, Scott and I have been working together for 17 years, and if you haven't noticed, we're a little different. You know? And... Uh, I looked at him and I said, Scott, in 17 years, have I ever pushed your button? <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> of course I've pushed his buttons many times. In fact, I dare say I've probably pushed his buttons more than he's pushed mine. He has pushed mine. But, you know, that's the nature of relationship, right? Right? And we've worked through some difficult periods in our working relationship and in our personal relationship. And what I can tell you right now, at year number 17, he and I are tight. We're close. We see the kingdom the same way. We see charity's future the same way. Do we always 100% agree? No. But we've learned to appreciate even when, each other even when we do disagree relationships get better through the tests, not through the easy times. What should make the relationships in church stand out? If they're going to have all the same messiness that our ones out there do, what is it that makes them stand out? Well, if they're Christ-centered, then I would guess that's forgiveness, wouldn't you? That we have an unswerving commitment to grace and forgiveness in our relationships. And that we are just as willing to offer it as we are to receive it, to seek it. Amen? I mean, grace and forgiveness should absolutely be the non-negotiable here. I mean, right now I'm looking at row number four here and I see four Packers people. I forgive you. <laughs> see how easy that was? And I'm sure you forgive my Vikings for crushing your Packers last week. <laughs> no. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't been here long enough for me to say something that bothers you, hang on, I will. I will. Or do something. Even Scott might at some point. We're imperfect people, but we commit to the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that helps us to grind through difficult periods. That's what family does, amen? That's what family does. If nothing else, maybe we can just be an extension of our families, huh? These relationships will bring clarity too. Parker Palmer is a well-known educator, uh, has written a lot of books, really great thinker, and he shares a story one time about a growth period for him where his relationships with his fellow brothers in Christ helped him gain some clarity, some truth about himself. And by the way, we never learn about ourselves when everybody loves us, do we? <laughs> no, we learn about ourselves when people speak truth into our lives, that is, it's the stuff we don't necessarily want to hear. And uh, as a leader, Parker had this th happen to him. What happened was he was offered a job as president of a prestigious university. So it was a big, big, big decision. Now, Parker is a Quaker, and so what Quakers do when they have big decisions is they gather a group of people, in their case because of kind of the way they're, it's men, because he's a man, a, a, they gather a group of men, and it's called a clearance committee, or a clearness committee, and, and it's to gather clarity. And, and so the idea is to get together and to talk and pray through this decision. And this is not just with brothers in Christ that he likes. This is with some people, too, who have also been tough on him. So he gathers this group together, and they, they pray, and then they begin discussing this decision that he has to make. And one of them looks at him and says, Parker, tell us, what is it about this new job that you think you would like? And Parker begins to think and mull it over, and, and, and he kind of starts to get a little irritated. And he, and he, says, he says, well, you know, I, I can tell you that I, I wouldn't like the politics. And then he mulls a little bit more, and he says, well, and I can tell you, I wouldn't like all the administrative work. And then the guy says to him, Parker, that's not the question. The question is, what would you like? What would you like? Uh, he starts to mull it over some more, and oh, I, well, I wouldn't like the fundraiser, the fundraising part of it. Parker, what is it that you would like? And then at that point, Parker, in a moment of self-confession, says, "I got very visibly irritated, and my face turned a light blush color, and I felt a bead of sweat form on my eyebrow." And he said. Then the answer hit me, and I was almost too embarrassed to say it, but I did. I looked at my clearness committee, and I said, well, I guess I would like seeing my picture in the paper with the name president under it, at which point everything just went dead silent. And then one of his colleagues broke the awkward moment with a question that made everybody else burst out in laughter. Parker, do you think there's another way easier to get your picture in the paper? He gained a lot of clarity in that moment. Because we're all tempted to do things that are good but for the wrong reasons, right? We need forgiveness. We need opportunities to exercise it, to give it, to receive it, to love and to be loved. We need opportunities to gain clarity because we're not always honest with ourselves, are we? Either intentionally or unintentionally. The truth is we need each other. Charity can't grow. We can't grow anymore if we don't begin to commit to be in, in relationships with each other that allow for just a little bit more risk, a little bit more sharing.
whether that's a learning group or a healing group or even more preferable, that risking getting into life groups, will it always work? No. Will you always have chemistry with people? No. Will you maybe need to change and try some new combinations of people? Maybe. Maybe. I've been in a small group for about six, seven years now. I get life from them. And I have relationships. I have a network of people that I turn to when I'm struggling. Where I can share my soul. And I need that. And I bet you do too, don't you? Bubba's going to help me right now. And he's in that other room. Come on out, Bubba. You're watching me on the TV. There he is. (laughs) Quit eating your cookies and coffee and help me out here. You may have noticed... um, you may have noticed that there are a lot of great hymns and worship songs about God, about His love, about His mercy, about His forgiveness, about this and about that. There are virtually no songs in the entire Christian music catalog about small groups. Really? Oh, I want to be in a small group with you. No. I could make something up. Yeah, no. No. But the other day, I was actually, I was editing, my, my second book is coming out very soon, and I was editing it, and I had alluded to a song in it that hit me. It's just like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. This is really about why we need small groups. So it's not about small groups, but it's a challenge to each of our hearts about why we need it. You might recognize the song, because I'm pretty sure you know the group. They're a bunch of old guys now. But the name of the group was the Eagles. Bubba's going to sing the first couple verses, and then we're going to do the weirdest thing that any church today is probably going to do. You're going to join him, and you're going to sing this song. And as you do it, you're going to really hear and let the words speak to your heart. Thanks, Baba. Stand for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He give you courage to walk, walk in relationships and risk relationships. Maybe give you the strength to ask and offer forgiveness continuously to grow. May he teach you to let him and others love you before it's too late. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See you next week.